As you notice, I've already started recording on what yes. will come to be known as either Modcast Episode 10 or Stewcast Episode 1, Legacy Numbering. And it's time for a new theme tune. We can't use the Mod theme tune for the Stewcast, can we? I assumed we would. Oh no. Stew Disco Brother to the Heme allegedly. Salty Pharmacy Dog. Definitely does not advertise and is tired of being a one note man. Concern for the death of disc. <laughs> Concern for the death of disco. But I'm ba do ba married into the family. Ba do ba do. Definitely normal stew sometimes. But best of all, disco stew. Stew cast. Ba do ba do boom 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 boom. Excellent. The stew theme tune and all it was only interrupted by somebody taking my phone and the air conditioner. But hopefully that didn't detract from the wonder of. The stew cast. What's it all about? I thought, I thought she left because of the uh, song. So the stew cast. What's the deal here, Nathan Paul O'Leary, King Zaz, my biological brother? Yes, we're going to look at Disco Stew for a, a brief spell, for a one-off special. Just uh, six clips that I think highlight the finer points in Stu's career. From what I've seen, there might be much better ones in episodes that I can't remember. Well, what we're doing is setting ourselves up for a Stucast 2. An inevitable Stucast 2. Two so, cast. Two cast, exactly. Senor Two Cast. Two cast oh. Stu Core. Brought to you by the Stu Casting Corporation, a division of the Dibney Multi Global Conglomerate Conglomerate Incorporate. Sponsors. Now we are mostly a mod based operation at the MF, DB, IT, B, C, W, X, Y, Z. But occasionally a shoe based investor might come and ask us to, you know, to, just to consult with them on shoe based matters. And so, as you know, the Disco Corporation, based out of Japan, that uh, sell dicing saws and grinding wheels and something called a DBG package singulation. They've given us a, they've, they've sponsored this show, so uh, they've sent us a little message, and I, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I'm going to read it out in my best, okay. in my best Japanese. Disco Kabushi Gaisha wa Stukast Honoko no partnership Kochiko Dekta Koto o Hokori ni Omote Mas. Disco Sutu ga Season Nana ni Tojo Shite Irai Watashi Tachi wa Fanu des. Disco ga Aisuri Jonetsu Tobi o Hyogen Shite Mas. Deza Setsudan o Yobi Kensaku no Nizu ni Awasete Sentaku Shite. Kudasai. Yours sincerely, the Disco Corporation out of Yokohama, Japan. What are your thoughts on that? That was a nice message from them, wasn't it? Yeah, it was lovely. I do like that it was all in Japanese except for the word sincerely. Well, what I, I have to say, I did I, add that bit. The fax may have got cut off just at the very end, so I imagine that it was signed from Mr. Hiroyuki Tojo Disco, the CEO of Disco Incorporated. I'm excited at the prospect of this, and as you know, I understood all of that. Good. Perfectly. Now, have you ever but I'm not prepared to. I'm not prepared to discuss what was said. No. And I don't think we should either, to be honest. If you're a Japanese speaker, obviously. You can critique. Maybe maybe the Disco Corporation need to brush up on their grammar and vocabulary. I don't know. I, I don't work for them. Anyway, so Stuart Discotech, as he is known. Now, he was once a sailor. Was he then called Stuart Nautical? I don't know. It was only upon doing this. Um, go, by research, I mean going on to the Simpsons fandom wiki. Um, that I learned that his surname was Discotech, which I disagree with. I don't think that's real. Well, it's unlikely that it was his real, as in birth name, but it's, it's possible. Discotech, it's, of course, meaning nightclub in English. It is the French word. It's just, if it is 
I mean, it is in there, in The Simpsons. It's it's stunningly lazy. It's like they decided at a certain point that everybody needed surnames. So they were like, first of all, you got Lenny and Carl, which was kind of funny. That was sort of like the early ones, Leonard, Leonard and Carlson. But then after that, yeah, they just started giving people like, oh, this guy, oh, this is Disco Stew, this should be his surname. Whereas if it was me, it would have been Goodman. Everyone would have been called Goodman, which is definitely the opposite of lazy. It's a hard working name. Yeah, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson, when I stamp on your foot, etc., etc. So, Disco Stew, what do you want to tell us about Stew before I launch into our first segment, Stew or False? Excellent. Um, I really like Disco Stew, particularly the design of Disco Stew, I like. Because I, I think I gravitate towards the ones that were fun to draw. So I had Disco Stew and Comic Book Guy and Frank. Maybe, the, I don't know, something to do with the glasses. He's a good guy. That's it. He is a good guy, but he's actually not a good guy. We will dig into deeper whether or not he's a good guy or a bad guy, but he's an interesting character. No one else represents that era, which is a rich era for American culture, which is obviously why they kept bringing him back, even though he was clearly the absolute definition of a one one note character based entirely on the gag where Homer, and we talk about this in, the, in, in one of the clips, Homer's made a jacket that says, should say disco stud, but apparently he ran out of space and so it says disco stew and then we, we later see the, that's a setup for a line where a character called disco stew arrives. But more time for that. So he's a disco aficionado. He owns a discotheque himself called Stu's Disco, which again, incredibly lazy. Stu at discotheque, in the same way that Boaty McBoakface and, and Patty McHat Hat is now, that's considered the epitome of high quality comedic writing. Yeah. Uh, but Stu, Stu's Disco, no, no, they could have spent five minutes and come up with a better discotheque name that's pretty early as well i think that's like not good early but not not like really late 13 or 14 maybe yeah and if we were a little bit more hard working we would also take five minutes to, to throw in some better disco names for stew's disco but maybe that'll be in a stew too late and that'll pop up in the next stew episode when we've had a year or two to stew on that thought yeah fantastic he's usually fe usually featured wearing a rhinestone encrusted leisure suit a leisure suit as the americans would say from the 70s and he sports a kind of afro now stew or false i'm going to throw you a fact you have to tell me whether you think or no if it's true or not stew yes. is an anglican takes his religion serious false tell me more he is i believe he's a catholic as we find out in one of the clips he is a Roman Catholic and he apparently described himself as a super Christian somewhere along the lines, but I'm not sure where. Yeah, I didn't know that part. Stu, Stupa. Stu, Stupa, Stupot, Stuart likes to drink vodka. Uh, false. I don't, I just don't remember ever seeing vodka in The Simpsons. Well, it's clear, so you wouldn't. But it's still visible. It is visible as a liquid, but... The reason why I don't think he's a vodka drinker is because we see him drinking what is almost certainly a brandy when he approaches Marge Simpson and tries to pick her up in that ski lodge again in one of our clips. Yes. So Stu, yeah, no. Stu likes to describe himself in the second person. No, I, I, isn't it the third person? Tell me more. Well, he calls himself Disco Stu. Several, several, in fact, in most of these clips, I think he refer Is there anywhere he doesn't? call himself blank stew whether it be nautical or disco well let's keep our eye open for that and see if he ever describes himself in the first or second person and there's anything other than describing himself because again that kind of is the joke that he doesn't advertise but he does say his name every time he speaks um yes. stew has gone through electroshock therapy um i think that's true for some reason i have it in the in my brain that that might be true so apparently he's been through several types of therapy not least one um shock therapy which left him as nothing stew because, <laughs> because there's only one thing worth worse than being defined by a single thing and that is being defined by absolutely nothing so he was called nothing stew 
That's good. I didn't know that. That's the best of the three names. Yeah, so normal stew, nautical stew, nothing stew, and disco stew with four. Oh yeah, normal stew likes normal things. Disco stew has dated many members of Springfield's Lady Folk, including three members of the Investorette, Marge, Maud Flanders, our main lady, her group, that we have not yet talked about in any of the episodes really so far. Stu has dated three of those ladies. Um, No, because I disagree, because it can only... I'm pretty sure it's Maud, Helen, Luann, Agnes, Edna and Marge. So we can only really go for Luann and Agnes and Edna. And I believe the only one out of those that... Well, you're assuming he Maybe dated them. Not. You're assuming he dated them as an as an adult, not in his oh, that... stew days. Oh yeah. Then I'm going to now say yes. I agree with you. Give me more. Tell me more. Like now. these days on quiz shows, they always do this, right? In the old days, it'd just be a, an answer, and they'd be like, "Yeah, I think it's red. It, it is red. Yeah." But now you have to explain your thinking because you know. 20th century moral, moral relativism explain your thinking why do you think he um why do you think he got it on with three of the investorettes and who were they what why do i think he did it or who do i think they are all of the above he's we've, we see him in the clips having a crack at marge so i don't think unless he's just forgotten anything but i don't think marge is one of them Maud definitely is not one of them edna's very likely as is um luan final answer please I'm, I'm gonna say i'm just gonna stick with two and who would they be luan and edna ping pong correct that's exactly who he the people of the investors that we know about again Stuart is a mysterious character he was married of course to marge's sister selma and i wonder at the time if she took the name of selma discotheque because that that's quite amusing apparently so when you go again this could just be people taking things too far but um on the if you go on selma on the kind of wiki it has her name as like you know mcclaw she's married she's married troy mcclaw lionel hutz Apu, Disco Stew, Sideshow Bob, uh, Grandpa. Grandpa Simpson? Yeah, she married Homer's dad in an episode. <laughs> oh yeah, because she's, she's Marge's sister, right? Of course. Yeah. All right, let's not, too far. let's not go too far down the Selma rabbit hole, because she is going to pop up in two of these six clips. We have plenty of time to talk about her. Last thing I want to throw in, which is a callback to our Maud cast. We have an ongoing trope that maybe Maud is somewhat dead inside, and she, um, she she's really struggling to interact with the world in anything other than a, a, in an attempt to destroy it. Here's, a, here's a, a quote which I believe comes from the Simpsons uh, tapped out game that we've read happens many times now. Saturday Night Fever Part 8. Last night, something inside Disco Stew kind of broke. In the middle of a Grey Stones medley, I realised I was dead inside. Deader than the fish in my platform shoes. It's time to take a look at my life and figure out what it's all about. Yeah, he kind of hints at this in one of the clips as well. Um, I think, whereas we have to speculate about Maud and her uh, personal thoughts, Disco Stew is very vocal about worries. He's very, he's very sort of emotions on his sleeve kind of guy he's he tells you exactly what disco stew's thinking when disco stew's thinking it yeah disco stew <clears throat> disco stew is not a closed he's not a closed book not in the way that that uh marge is but i do hear that maybe we do have um we do <laughs> i think i'm doing it on purpose now <laughs> we do have, I believe, Disco Stew, a volume of Disco Stew's uh, diary or, or autobiography that we'll be digging into a little later. Is that correct? Yes, it's right here. Excellent. Well, you put that one to one side because now, if it's okay with you, we're going to move into content. We're allowed a slightly different variation of the government regulated banter time that we normally have, but I think we've uh, we pushed it as far as we want to, really. So, anything to say before we jump into what is going to be a rip roaring ride through one of Stu's many arcs. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to bring up before we move on is that I've set fire to the museum with Stamp inside. Oh, good lord. <laughs> you talk about the Maud Flanders Internet Museum database, hotcake, fish yeah. monkeys, etc, etc. Yeah, but this isn't the Maudcast, so I'll tell you more next time. Please do. It's burning right now, though. Yeah, it's burning pretty. Pretty black, thick smoke. Clip one from season 18. 
So this is, I imagine, the first point in time chronologically that Stu appears. I believe so. Marge is working as a photographer in the mall, by the looks of it. And the voiceover says at 24, her photography ambitions were underdeveloped. And so we see, we see Marge working in what I imagine is Springfield Mall. Looks more 80s than 70s, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And we see a, a young sea captain style fellow. He's, very, he's dressed very much like the old sea captain, but a younger version. He's got a captain's hat. He's got the blue jacket. And he sits down with a very reasonable request. I need one wallet size photo for my captain's license this this person is about to go somewhere in, in the in the seafaring world he's got the thick irish accent that you that you would imagine from a seafaring captain because apparently they're all irish so he sits down and um this man is clearly going up in the world in the end uh, i think i guess marge to set the mood asks if, if uh, he minds if she puts on some music and she clicks on the radio what should come out from that infernal boom box but uh a disco song, Disco Inferno, just blasting out. And Stu leaps up and he shouts, It's so danceable. It's so danceable. Nautical Stu loves disco music, throws off his cap. He's already wearing flared Saturday night fever pants and these platform kind of shoes. And his hair's already a proto afro as he rips off his, his cap. So I'm going to dig into this in a little bit. I'm, I'm a little bit suspect that this actually was the trigger for him. But anyway, he rips off his jacket to reveal a puffy shirt that's open to the waist and a medallion. His hips are going, his arms are loft a la Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. He's laughing, ha, 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 puts on the grasses, and Disco Stew is here. And the world welcomed Disco Stew. That signature sound. So what? Marge turned nautical stew into disco stew. What is your take on that? My take on this scene is first of all, it's 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 funny in a stupid way. It's funny in a like incredibly lazy. It's it's very cheap comedy, but it worked for me. I think that in a Springfield world, he has been repressing some kind of disco love for a while because he's ready at a moment's notice. Like, even the sunglasses he already has. So I think let's do a bit of spectral speculations. Stutral. Stutral yes. speculations. Stutral stutulations. Um, I imagine he was pushed into nautical school or some kind of nautical training by his parents and the disco repression he was sort of banned from listening to disco music growing up so i imagine this is the first time he has heard disco music but he's been ready to hear it and change his entire life at a wow. moment's notice. so I, I thought that he'd known it before and basically he's just kind of like playing along and waiting for the time to to come out of that disco closet but you think it actually like he kind of had hints, but he didn't know, and it would just took that catalyst. Marge just happened to be the person who sent him finally off on that disco path. Yeah, his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Discotech, must have, maybe they fought against the, oh. um, fought against their name, as in the same way that, you know, if you if your name was Mr. and Mrs. Hamburglar, you might fight against your child becoming gay. So Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. Discotech may or may not have turned young Stuart against the world of disco and that might have been why he repressed his feelings but one thing's for sure definitely out of the disco closet there and uh, yeah. so is this do you think this is the era of disco and we're supposed to think that that stew's discoing in real time or is he like way behind the curve i think the joke was that he was behind the curve but this is a flashback, isn't it? So Marge is like 19 or something, which would put it in like the late 70s, possibly early 80s. I think late 70s, if it's based on the same sort of high school times. Yeah, because the time's pretty flexible, as we've said many times. It's kind of like an elastic time. Yeah, it's, it's entirely possible that Stu's right on the number. But then again, Disco Inferno by the Tramps is a classic, and he could have heard it any time. And it is probably a little bit more funny if Stu was 10 years late to the disco game, and he'd repress these disco feelings all through nautical school. But he was ready. That's, that's what I like to think. Right on. So clip two, this is the classic, Two Bad Neighbours. So this is season seven. This is the first time that the 
the DS actually turned up on our screens. So they're on the front lawn of, again, the Simpsons house. In the last few episodes, quite a few things have taken place on their front lawn. We had the snake thing, then we had uh, Marge coming out of prison, and now we've got the, the yard sale. This is actually, yeah. uh, we're on the on about season four, aren't we, in the Mordcast? So we're jumping way ahead here. Yeah, this is like seven. For some reason, you give me some context maybe, Ned and Homer are trying to sell things on their front lawn. Ned holds up the jacket and shows, now folks, nothing spells fun like rhinestones on a dungaree jacket. You know, you can see the giant head in the background that I think Mr. Burns gave him at some point. And Stu is with his 70s kind of rocker friend and we see Stu now in classic Stu mode. And I want to talk about his outfit in a moment because it is good. It is, it's a great design. Yeah. Um, and he says, hey, Stu, you should buy that. And here we go. Here's the line we're all waiting for. Hey, Disco Stu doesn't advertise. Now, earlier, as we said, we set up the Disco Stud and he ran out of space. Again, he refers to himself as Disco Stu well, whilst saying that he doesn't advertise. So entirely paradoxical in his first appearance. The outfit reminds me of an Elvis sort of outfit. Elvis wore those jumpsuits, right, in the late 70s, but it's heavily styled on Travolta's kind of look in Saturday Night Fever, the white suit, and we actually encounter John Travolta in one of these clips dressed in that outfit. Yeah. But, uh, but it's not quite the same. In fact, it's quite radically different. He's got the dark round glasses. That's unique. He's got the uh, open shirt with the medallion. That's very... That's very disco, man. Big pastel blue shirt with huge collars. But, you know, the pièce de résistance is the leisure suit. Not a jumpsuit, because a jumpsuit is kind of like that one that you see Freddie Mercury wearing, maybe, or even Elvis, where it's kind of like it's a, almost a one-piece, right? This is a yeah. actual suit. But he's got these, you know, he's got these flared white pants and those platform shoes, but, but he's got these flames going up the arms and legs, and that's, that's the real deal for Stu. Yeah, it's a very, to say they try and keep things simple, in, so they can obviously like reuse things at an easy pace. They try and keep all the designs pretty easy. Like there's no like, you know, like not a lot of checkered stuff, not a lot of lines on clothes and stuff. But he has quite a, like even now looking at the whole gang, he has the most sort of intricate costume. And again, that's probably because they were only planning on using him that one time. It's possible. I mean, he's, he's the classic one note character. He's the classic gag character. And there's been a few in The Simpsons. The other one that jumps out to me is John. Joey Jojo Jr. Shabadoom, who again has popped up a couple of times, but Disco Stew's appeared like 70 times now in the history of The Simpsons. So, yeah, he moved from that kind of one note thing to that sort of C list might occasionally you know he might get an episode in like season 35 in the way that kent brockman has had an episode and like you know a couple of the not technically not like supporting in the way of like mo and crusty and that kind of stuff but the next rung down on the ladder with like like gil i'm just picking out random ones that i can see you know the old jewish man um manjula just say, oh, the, say all the character on your shelf. Yeah, Frank Grimes, Wendell. Well, they're rich, and the thing is that the, the Disco Stew, again, as we see from these clips, at least some of them, culturally, he allows them to talk about stuff that they don't talk about anywhere else, and I don't know they've necessarily taken, taken advantage of that. He could easily, of all the characters, he could easily be one that a spin-off show could be based around without too much effort. If you're going to spin off a Simpsons character, you could do far worse and spinning off Disco Stew. Yeah, they discussed at one point a spin-off just about Springfield where it would focus on a different person every week. Right. But then they ended up, pretty early on, this was like, they ended up doing, just doing that episode where it, you know, kind of went around and you saw, like, Apu for a minute and then it cut to, like, Cletus and then, you know, like, Bumblebee Man. Yeah, it was like 21 short films about Springfield, isn't it? It was a parody of the, was it the Robert Altman style? Do we ever see yes. that rocker, do we ever see the rocker friend again? No, that I also made a note of that. I don't know who that guy is or what importance he bears. But yeah, from my knowledge, I don't. You discuss you sort of a lone wolf after this occasion. He's never really seen with a friend. So, well, that that loneliness that strikes at the heart of disgust you does pop up, and it's a it's a it's a good way to go for a character. It's the tears of a clown motif, isn't it? Because it's a good way to go with a character who is all about show and and uh, 
uh, and fun to show that actually yeah. they're very lonely and sad underneath. And uh, it's a rich vein that I'd like to find out more about uh, about Stu. But one thing I did know to, is to go back to the Maud cast. Don't forget Maud's still paying our bills here. We still got to make the occasional mention to her. Yep. They're selling like a boat painting at that yard sale. And I wonder whether it's one of Maud's because we speculated that Maud is a painter and an artist. And there's and every all of the pictures in the Flanders house generally seem to, to be about water. I wonder if this is a, a Maud piece of art, do you think? Maybe. This is where I'm going to um, mildly disagree with you. I think that Maud is a sketcher because it's been made clear that Marge is a painter with the Ringo star stuff. So I think that if we're going for this whole mirror thing, then Maud would be more of a... I think she would stick to sketching, whereas Marge would stick to painting. Interesting. All right. So if you do want to hire Stu's costume, there is an Australian website called Amazing Transformations, and for a mere 75 Australian dollars, don't know how much that is in pounds, you can get a fairly authentic Stu costume. Pretty cool. Is that how it's described? Sorry? Is that how it's described? A fairly authentic Stu costume. I don't know yeah. how to describe it. It's how I would describe it because that is an accurate description. True. This is unrelated, but I once drove past, I think it was a laundrette or something, and its sign was probably the best laundrette in town. Nice. Yes. Hedge your bets. And the thing is about <laughs> laundrettes, it's really hard to compare them. I don't know if you've ever been around trying to get a, a reading on which laundrette is the best. I mean, I wouldn't even know what the criteria is, to be honest. Clip three. Okay. Season 11, Little Big Mom. They're in the ski yeah. lift. And as always, stop me if, if I go long, because some of these are a bit long. You know, so, so uh, Stu is out there and he goes, Snow Fox at five and he turns himself to five o'clock and Stu's cradling a pretty large brandy in this in this snow lodge and he seems to have been at the bar trying to work his magic on Edna Krabappel but he, he quits that and he disco dances and slides over in Marge's direction disco lady starts singing lyrics from the Johnny Taylor 1976 hit disco lady Stu is not in this classic mode here he is in winter mode white turtleneck still got the medallion he's wearing a a safari jacket and these huge kind of like pan, pants style I don't know what those weird pants are he's still got his platforms on but they've got red flames going up the platforms he sidles over to, to Marge and says is this seat taken she says I think that's an armrest he responds with do you party She's, <laughs> you mean hat and noisemakers sure baby whatever your trip is Disco Stu wants you to be comfortable while he does his thing it's clear to me that Stu is a lady chaser we already know that he's had his time with Edna Krabappel yeah. so he's having another go there maybe or maybe later and then the kids arrive and it's two bolts kids back away <laughs> not today disco lady um, but Stu's a free spirit right he's not a family man I guess although we do find how he's a sensitive man he does want to be a good husband but does he want to be a father to those little disco disco lets um, no he, um, this is my favourite disco Stu clip I think from start to finish from, from just walking away from Edna what seems to be mid conversation to the outfit and the fact that he's still wearing the sunglasses which he's in a snowy place so that, that kind of makes sense. Maybe it's bright. But he is indoors. And um, ignoring the fact that he's, he's asked, can he sit on the armrest? And that she didn't say yes or no. And then my favourite line is, Disco, she wants you to be comfortable while he does his thing. Which, when Marge, Marge in like the end of this scene, gets, uh, I think a clock falls on her leg. So her leg gets broken. And um, when she gets the cast taken off, she's got a doctor called uh, Dr. Sakamoto, I think. And he says to her, Dr. Sakamoto wants you to be comfortable while he does his thing. <laughs> Nice. Call back. Love it. But yeah, I think uh, it's it's pretty apparent that he, he's easily pleased, but he does not want any any kind of commitment whatsoever. He's a free spirit. He's a loose man. He lives nighttime. He lives in the night. Stu, one thing I like about his design is he seems to have kind of like bags under his eyes. He's not a youthful disco man. He's he, they, They've kind of played in a little bit to the fact that, you know, disco has been over for quite a while. And disco Stu's not just a little bit out of the game, but he's... Uh, He's getting on a little bit. 
He's... Yeah, I think I think he's quite old, and uh, yeah, I do like the idea that he may when he got his like nautical or when he was going for his uh, captain's license or whatever. That maybe at that point he was be like thirty five. Yeah, he didn't look too tired then, but yeah, now he looks he looks like an old man who is refusing to give up to accept that Disco is gone. And he does touch on that a little bit, doesn't he, in, in a clip coming up soon. I, I wonder if they decided to just, because his, his, the joke is so silly, that they just decided that everything, every joke they make with Stu is going to be just the most basic. Yeah. They're not going to attempt until later to put any nuance to the character, so it is just going to be, well, he's his name's D Stuart Disco Tech, and he has a disco called Stu's Disco. Yeah, it's probably got a dog called Disco Dog. Oh, yes, I can imagine that. And um, yeah, they haven't really tried very hard with Stu, but I think the joke is that it's just it's just easy comedy, isn't it? You can just it's an easy one gag, like oh let's cut to disgust Stu. He's a rich seam, but they're not really digging very deep into him. No, and there was a time between like like around this sort of time of this clip and the next couple of seasons where they really they really just liked disgust Stu, and he would just show up quite a lot. Yeah, but I think you picked some good clips here. So we're going to four crossover crossover alert season. 12 going to Praiseland so spoiler alert Maud Flanders dies she hasn't died yes. in our podcast yet because we're still on season 4 but she does yeah, die she does die and Ned opens up a theme park based on her called Praiseland this is the first clip that doesn't revolve around the Simpsons Bart's in it a little bit at the end but it's it's a totally Stu related clip that's just about him so Stu's in the Maud Flanders based theme park not internet museum and database, just straight up theme park. He approaches the statue of Maud, humming a groovy tune, and he kneels in front of Maud. And I, I, I seem to remember the con the concept of this is that people get do their dreams come true? Do their wishes come true? There's a gas leak right under the statue that's just making people go crazy, but they all see the version of heaven. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, Stu says, "Lay some heaven on me, foxy dead chick." One thing I notice is that Stu. Stu's growing rings on his fingers, and he has, even though it's hard to tell because they only have four fingers, um, or three fingers, depending on how you count them, he um, he has got a ring on his wedding ring finger. So maybe he's married at this point. I don't know. He's definitely not made to sell her anymore. But he hits the ground, and he's wriggling on his belly, and he's kind of screaming and jerking. And then we fade to the pearly gates where there's a, a line. You've got John Travolta in his full Saturday Night Fever outfit. I believe Liza Minnelli behind behind him and then Andy Warhol and interestingly, if you look at some pictures from Studio 54, the, of the most famous disco of all time, there are pictures. There's a famous one of Bianca Jagger, Mick Jagger's wife, riding around on a white horse. But you can see Andy Warhol in these pictures. In fact, there's a photograph of Andy Warhol and Liza Minnelli at Studio 54. I don't know who the others are. But anyway, they were lining up for the pearly gates and um, Disco Stew in, in classic mode turns up in a cloud limousine and he's greeted by St. Peter who takes him right to the front of the line in front of everybody else and the pearly gates open up and, and, and Stu boogies into heaven he hits the dance floor and who should be there but old blue eyes himself Frank Sinatra who says hey for me this is hell you dig Pally we cut back to Stu wriggling on the ground in, in real life Springfield and Bart moves in quickly and sweeps him up with a brush and gets on to the next person I believe it's comic book guy what do you got to say about that? yeah great great clip for the mod cast on the Stu cast coming together um foxy dead chick is wildly inappropriate for uh, for somebody to say in you know in the museum paying respect to that person foxy dead chick. but again very it one note Stu goes to heaven it is a theme and it's it's yes true and again so this puts he's had interest now in every investorette except for agnes i believe no oh, well, it's always time yes uh yeah it's heaven is very one note it's just it's just a disco and here are some people who like discos for some reason john travolta in this really reminds me of when they uh when they do woody allen oh yeah like he just it's just really sort of like sort of like limp and pathetic he is a bit whiny at the end isn't he but you know the thing is that frank sinatra actually recorded a couple of disco singles at the height of disco like everybody did disco singles you know every single every single pop star in the late 70s had a go had a pop at doing disco singles and and then no blue 
Blue Eyes was no different. But um, here's what's interesting, totally unrelated to The Simpsons. But in, in 1978, the Studio 54 disco in New York was voted the second best disco in the world. Do you know where the first best was voted by Billboard magazine? Best disco in the world in 1978. I'm going to just hazard a guess at the, uh, the Wigan Casino now. It was the Wigan Casino. The Wigan Casino that. in 1978 was voted by Billboard magazine as the best disco in the world above Studio 54. Amazing. Nice. So here's what, what's also good. You know, this is giving me a chance to talk about the disco era, which they, I, I don't know if they touched on too much, but it was hugely controversial in the States, like disco. It was hugely popular, but also massively despised. And there was this cool thing called the Disco Demolition Night, which was, I guess, the Chicago White Sox Stadium. To sell a few more tickets, <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't getting enough punters in. So they did this thing where people would come and they would actually blow up a crate of disco records. So they put a crate of disco disco records in the middle of the stadium and they just blew it up and um, so there was a bit controversial because a lot of people said that we're against disco not necessarily because of music but because of the lifestyle you know it was it was it came from black clubs it came from gay clubs and uh, white american rock audiences in the late 70s maybe weren't maybe weren't quite ready for that what do you no, think Stu's take was on that um i think Stu's quite a, a liberal guy I think he was looking for a place like the places that the disco offer, and that's how uh, that's how normal stew and nautical stew fell by the wayside. Yeah. So I think he's yeah, I think he's he's fully into every aspect of disco, not just the music. He likes the lifestyle. He's gone deep into disco, but obviously, tragically, just as him being a man out of time, he's neither black or gay from what from what we can see, what we can take in, and so he's completely displaced from every aspect of the disco lifestyle yes. he's in the wrong place the wrong time and the wrong everything but yet disco stew does not give up however as the uh, i think it's the next clip isn't it will disparage all of this well we will go on to clips clip five because i you know it, who knows whether he was just having a bad day or whether he really felt this so this is a season 14 episode so Stu in classic mode he struts out of his disco we assume stew's disco into a taxi He's got his arms behind his head. He's funky and relaxed. Again, Travolta-esque. Making disco beats with his mouth. Uh, the taxi driver turns back and says, Hey, looks like somebody got down tonight. Hey, Disco Stu always gets down because when the beat is hot, and then he just pauses mid-sentence and he just takes off his glasses and you see this weary, weary look on his face. Can you keep a secret? Yeah, what is it, hon? Leans forward and takes off his glasses to show those sad, bagged eyes. I hate disco. It's all I've talked about for so long people think i'm a one note guy and uh you know and then he cuts to lisa apparently this is all on tv and uh and lisa says i had no idea disco stew was so complex so where are we yeah. at that that's a bomb like, isn't it yeah i like that line a lot um very meta but um yeah i like the whole concept of this i, I do like um i like that he just gives up mid-sentence <laughs> like he do, he's the best thing about him might be his walk. I was going to say that in the uh, the heaven clip as well. He's, strut. But, um, He's a strutter. And you go from that to within within a minute of this knowing this again, being this emotions on his sleeve kind of guy. Just this stranger that he doesn't know within a minute of uh, being asked how he is, just completely opens up about com like disliking his life. He can't hold back the truth no more. And unfortunately for him, he was being filmed secretly and it's been broadcast on TV, so I don't know what his repercussions were, if any. Yeah, I guess. Because he doesn't seem to have any friends that like Disco, so maybe nobody cared. Maybe they're like, yeah, whatever, Disco Stews doesn't like Disco anymore. Doesn't matter. We still love his discotheque. It's still the coolest place around. He doesn't have any friends, I don't think. Stu doesn't dis doesn't DJ at the discotheque, though. He just kind of, we assume he owns it. We don't see him doing day-to-day -day disco business. It might be similar to Barney with the Bolorama, how it's called Barney's Bolorama, but it's owned by his uncle who's called like Al oh so you mean there might, Maybe. Be, you know, there might be another mastermind behind this that's not Stuart Discotech yes but they have named it 
after Stu. Or maybe they're also called Stu. Maybe it's the other guy from earlier. And he's also called Stu. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It'd be quite quite the coincidence though, wouldn't it? Yeah. He, um, so this this TV show, is that the only reference you get to the TV show? Or do you what do we see more of this documentary? No, you see more the, I think it's sort of like the setup for the rest of the episode in uh, the next one you see is Homer. And I think he complains about the family. Okay. So it's like a secret then, camera show, right? And is that that's the premise? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then they sent him to rock and roll camp to meet Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Elvis Costello, etc. All seems perfectly reasonable. Yes. Um, Elvis Costello, by the way, attended the 1972 Bickershaw Festival along with Joe Strummer. Um, and I believe this episode is called How I Spent My Strummer. So is Joe Strummer from The Clash in it? I don't think so. I think it's just more of a play on how you strum a guitar and he goes to, you know, like rock and roll camp. We could go on about this bombshell from Stu forever and I'm hoping we do more Stu cast and we can get back into it. But time is short. Our allotted time is running out and we got two more clips to go. So let's keep going. Clip six, something about marrying. So Patty and Selma are at home. Patty's getting ready to marry marry somebody she's wearing a cool black and white suit Selma's laying on pretty hard for her leaving her alone Selma says I'm just finding it hard to getting used to the idea of being alone and Patty points out that she has been married Selma's been married three times Selma then sighs and says actually four you see last week at which point Disco Stu slides in through the door in classic mode two years later than his disco revelation so either he's gone back to hiding it or he's gone back to loving Disco. We all feel that way sometimes. Disco Stews has got an annulment. So the grounds are never clear, but for some reason, John Paul II, the Pope at yeah. the time, which tells us that he is a Catholic, and they must have got married in a Catholic church, which I wonder is that. Is that Father Sean at St. Jerome's? Who knows? Because, you know, obviously, obviously, the Reverend Lovejoy Church is, a, is an Anglican church. So Stu boogies down. He does the twist. He does some fierce splits. And then he he's out the door. And uh, yeah, so where are we at with yeah, that? It's another weird one. I like it that they are, uh, again, just in this period of time, whether it's picking Disco Stu a lot for the who shall we use? kind of jokes yeah it also sets it in a specific time of John Paul 2 it does it and a real world event which is which is dangerous yeah they don't often they do it sometimes but they don't do it that frequently yeah I kind of thought this was the only reference to this but it turns out that it's not as we will see but yeah I think we can jump straight in the next clip because there's not a lot more there other than I'd just like to know who Patty was getting married to yeah she was getting married to a lady called Veronica who uh -huh. then it turns out was a man pretending to be a woman so Patty calls off the wedding it probably won't play that well these days who knows Moving who on. knows I do know that Patty has an afro very similar to Stu's Salma however does not she has that weird penis shape head yes <laughs> Season 27. Now, one thing I noticed about the animation here is the lines are way thinner. They've done something with the animation that probably gives them more scope in how they can draw characters. So it's probably a good thing, but it's kind of somewhat lost that classic Simpsons feel for someone who hasn't watched too many episodes from this era. Yeah. Uh, so so this is several years later, we, we imagine, and Selma is sat on her sofa. Something's gone wrong. She It's called Puffless, so I guess, it, just like Duffless was about giving up beer, this is about giving up cigarettes right thank god i've got a past full of lonely men to draw from and she she pulls up her, on her phone a, a folder full of ex-husbands including tony fat bob sideshow and Stu disco and uh he ph phones up disco and disco Stu says disco Stu is over you he does like to rhyme where he can doesn't he but he doesn't always rhyme but of course it's far from the case that disco Stu is over selma he's got posters everywhere so there's the, there's a movie called selma which is about the the uh, civil rights marches in alabama They've got the, the a parody of that, which is which has Selma's head on it. And, but all around his walls, he's got posters and pictures of her. He's got a cushion. But he also has some groovy 70s style non-Selma related things like a lava lamp and a groovy plastic like chair, like a 70s shag carpet. But this 
Gusty was a proud man, and he says, this Gusty needs a Zoloft or two. So he's clearly on the antidepressants there. But he's a sensitive man, so what do we make of that? Yeah, it seems like, again, I, I assumed he seemed pretty happy when the annulment came through, whereas now some time has passed. Selma in this time has also now adopted a daughter from China, which um, you'd think would put him off, but clearly doesn't. So maybe Selma is the one for him. I was going to say, Selma and Mo has always been the one that made sense that they should do, but they haven't really. Okay. Apparently, though, at least Stu consented to some kind of fling after Patty left the apartment because then Patty came back and the sisters kind of got back together. Selma said she'd made a few mistakes while Patty was away. At this point, Stu walks out of the bedroom, butting up his shirt and said, very sadly, you said it was serious this time. Yeah, I missed that. I didn't notice. I didn't see that one. But it's the first time I've seen where he doesn't refer to himself in the third person. Yes, it's, it's the only one time in these clips as well. Well, that's interesting. But yeah, so I don't know if that continues, but I doubt it. Um, but no, he also seems, well, he's continuing to commit to calling himself Disco Stu when he's alone in his room. So that makes me think that he's just back into Disco. I think so. Or, or that those that, that Disco's got its claws into him so deep that he just can't get out. Yeah, so maybe he's just continued to call himself self disco stew but has no affiliation to disco anymore except for his well, clothes it's something that apartment. i hope we can come back to over the inevitable stew stew two cast and the three stew two cast yes. of the next few years but i enjoyed that the arc yep. from nautical man to disco owner ladies man and hurt lover to the burnout and the parts we haven't seen yet of normal stew and ultimately returning to disco stew and then there's even a clip of an old man disco stew sat on his porch at some point that's pretty disco cool. shrew. and there's disco shrew from the halloween episodes there's so many much more stew we could get into doesn't he play Stonewall Jackson as well nice and we haven't even got into the fact that there's a rumour that, that Sideshow Rahim our favourite Sideshow is uh, potentially his brother that's what it says on the fandom page but I've seen no evidence of this anywhere yeah that's what I think people can just sort of like there's some stuff on there about Bard's family or like relatives of people where it seems like they've just guessed or made up a name themselves oh Nadina Flanders are we talking about here you, you're you're still hurting about that one yeah no I remember it said something about it might have been like Sarah Wiggum or something but it was, it was a couple of characters where they just guessed what the parents would be called with no basis we're heading for the stew straight in the stewtorium and so what I would like to do is just round up with a question of what have we learned about Stu and are there any parts of his arc that you know have not featured in these clips at all? Um, there is quite a lot of stuff obviously that has been left out that we could look at again but I tried to cover all the semi-important stuff or the stuff where something changed so that's why I picked these clips. We've learned that he doesn't particularly like disco. Possibly dead inside he's possibly tired of being a one note character and i think there's a rich seam in there and i just want to do more stew i don't want to abandon the mod cast but i want to return to stew and dig deep 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 into stuart discotheque aka yes. stuart nautical aka stuart normal aka stuart nothing so Precisely. here's a few things that that were facts we didn't get to earlier in the thing he's addicted to sugar taking it yeah in the way one might take other drugs it's keeping Stu wide awake for those disco nights, but it's probably not a lot good long-term strategy, is it? No, but just kind of irritated me more than anything. Well, you thought it was lazy or you thought it was somehow offensive? It's just, no, it's just lazy. Just lazier than everything else we've talked about. He does seem like he's a character in which they've got a lot of potential and at every single turn they've given him the laziest character traits the laziest words but again i wonder if that's conscious it's like we're going to make this person potentially super interesting but everything we do about them is going to be the first idea we come up with we're not we're going to think inside the box for disco stew disco stew thinks inside the box that could be his sadly sadly, sadly I, that's the case i think it's just disco stew became prominent at a time when the simpsons wasn't at its strongest mm. well that's a controversial statement that i'm going to ignore 
ignore and move on because he's voiced, as you know, by... Hank Azaria. Yes, but originally he was supposed to be voiced by Bill Hartman and I wonder whether he, he would have been retired like McClure and Hutz had this been the case. Yeah, I couldn't work out. I thought Phil Hartman had voiced him once and I thought maybe it was the Disco Studio doesn't advertise line, but we'll have to check in on that in a stew too In a stew too many things. Apparently Hartman did do the voice of Stu now. I don't know if it's that line, but when they were called back in for, I think, more voiceover and more, maybe they changed the script around a little bit or whatever. He wasn't available and so Hank Azaria stepped up. I don't know exactly the details of that, but... They did a similar thing with Mo and Mr. Burns in the first season. Somebody else did the voices for them and then they re-recorded it before it went out. So unless they re-recorded it, but I don't know why they would. I'm going to throw three facts at you. You can tell me. You know them all, I think. However, you can talk about any of them or none of them. Number one, he has adult braces apparently on his teeth. Number two, he has fish in his platforms. We know that. And number three, he was a stone cutter. Any of those uh, pique your interest? Yeah, I didn't know the first one. And I don't remember him being in the stone cutters episode. But I remember on that on the taps out game, you can get him in a stone cutter outfit. So I assumed he had been at some point. But I don't remember him being. In fact, I'm pretty sure that episode is before this one. Well, then maybe. Maybe it's non-canon. Who knows? And the very last one before we move into Stu Art is that apparently he has a drink called the Bull Ring, which is a mixture of Red Bull and Lifesavers, which he drinks to keep himself awake. Again, unfortunately, tapped out. Tapped out is, is a rich seam of, of fact <laughs> minor characters. Yeah, it is. It does sort of, because every character you get has some kind of storyline when you get them. So everybody has like a moment to shine, including, you know, all the minor, minor characters. Which I think is super cool, but I think it's probably like the Star Wars Extended Universe verse and it's not really canon full canon yeah like, not like our diary that's going to come up soon that's full yeah. canon yeah i think it is written by writers of the simpsons so that makes it slightly more that's believable it. but yeah no i don't buy into it mods i think mods like tech box when you get her says something like who's edna cravapple and that's always irritated me somewhat as mm. they were clearly friends yeah i don't like that i don't like that sometimes when you get spin-off materials and this was something I didn't like about the comics when I did read them from time to time is that they would say and do things that didn't seem that they would work in universe and now yeah. we're just talking exactly at like those people that were mocked in that episode of the Simpsons where they asked um who was it was, the, was this episode 3f16 scratchy clearly what what's the which what am I remembering here it's something to do with a xylophone being in the wrong key it's the three nerds from Springfield University uh, yeah. I think that's Poochie episode oh, that's one of my favorites does Poochie is there room for a Poochie cast or is he just in that one episode no there's plenty of room for a Poochie cast I think my rule would be if you're in two episodes you're prime for it or even if you just yeah. don't want to I don't think I could do a Grimes cast Although, having said that, oh. I think we could definitely do a Grimes cast. <laughs> yeah, he would, like, there's a few more grimy. Nobody's just had the kind of one appearance. All right, so we're good. We can do this. We yeah. can do this until we run out of, of tape. All right, let's move on. At the risk of this being a two-hour episode, let's move on to Stu Art. Now, I did choose a couple of pieces of Stu Art. I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, the first one I'm not even officially calling Stu Art because it, the sketch itself, is just it's just to go along with a piece of fan fiction that somebody wrote this is pro this is cartoons lover 16 on deviant art after finishing my martha and disco stew story boogie down on love in which martha quimby leaves joe quimby and moves in with stew I wanted to make a picture featuring Martha and Stu's future. I gave Stu a different outfit that shows he's both a disco man and a father. They have two kids, one son and one daughter, both named after the main characters in the movie Grease. Little John, <laughs> her dark brown like his mother's status, firstborn. Olivia, her light brown like her father's status, secondborn. I'll come up with bio soon for now. Just adore Stu's beautiful family. I know I adore Sideshow Bob's family. What do you make of that? 
Nice. Who did this? I know you suspect me, but it's not. It's cartoon, <laughs> Cartoons Lover 16. Nice. I just noticed, I know that the, I have somebody on Instagram who particularly likes Sideshow Bob and his family and also writes some kind of fan stuff, so I wondered if it was the same person. Um, I'm, I like this. I'm all about this. I think it's a, in terms of, you've just, it, I've been outmoded with minor female characters there with Martha Quimby. Martha Quimby, yeah. And so Martha is, I read some of the story, you know, Stu Charm, Martha after Joe's persistent womanizing. What I what I do like is that um, this person is our level of ridiculousness in that they've given the children names. Although I would question why you would give them the names from Greece when Travolta is in Greece, but it's set in the 50s, isn't it? It's not a 70s disco movie. So I gotta I gotta question yeah. Cartoons Lover on that. Maybe I would have gone with the names of the characters from Saturday Night Fever. But you know you can't have everything and the story no. boogie down on love which i did read some of is pretty cool so thank you cartoons lover for taking this to the same level of ridiculousness that we are and we respect yeah. for sure i like the title a lot as well boogie down on love yes groovy 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 so now we come to one can you see that yeah i would like to see it bigger if possible i'm going to zoom in to 150 now this when i first saw it i thought it was kind of like um fabric kind of like a a plush toy but it's not it's made out of sugar it's a it's essentially it's essentially a cake oh, wow. sugar. and the artist sugar voyager has made this for the 30th anniversary of the simpsons I'm very happy that they have we got a, a fairly groovy version of disco stew in full classic outfit holding up a mirror and if you go onto instagram which is where i found this you you can see like his hair is made Made out of strands of sugar and it's really really very accurate to say this was rendered out of icing sugar or correct me bakers and, and, and sugar decorators whatever kind of sugar you're using there i think it's pretty fabulous yeah i like this the most so far possibly out of all the all the mod art and stuart we've looked at including my own it looks like they did a they did like a Coraline parody in one of the halloween later halloween ones and he kind of looks like he's come from that universe but no i like everything i like everything about this there isn't a negative would you like to bite its head off or would you keep it gathering dust in your cupboard? Yeah, I think I would preserve it. Oh. I'd like to get Sugar Voyager's take on this. So Sugar Voyager, if you're listening, please tell us, do you like people to keep your decorations to go moldy and dusty in their cupboards or would you rather they tear off their heads and enjoyed and celebrated having stew having stew dribble down their down their throats? My last point about that one is, did they do a lot of characters or did they just do stew? And did they do stew because of the sugar addiction? Oh, that's a clever one. I don't know. I did look and I can't remember, but I did look at Sugar Voyager's uh, site and I don't think they did a whole bunch of Simpsons stuff. No, I think this was more, maybe a one-off. Yes. But you know, maybe we'll find out in a stew too late or maybe not. I did go a bit wild with a third piece. So this is um, Chris51. <laughs> He, this dude, and I looked at his work, is super talented tattoo artist and he does like graphic design of like Simpsons mashups with everything and they are like literally like the level that you would see from like the Simpsons stuff you buy in the shop. So he's got like mashups of like Scooby-Doo and the Simpsons or whatever. Or nice. playing American football or whatever and it is indistinguishable from like the cards the collector cards so which I was this this I think this version's a little bit more he's gone for a little bit more of a, a kind of like homemade feel on this and it's essentially a record sleeve that he's adapted so it's, it is an actual record that I think he's taken and um, put like Disco Stu's face onto somebody's body could be Elvis in his in yeah, the I suit. I just zoomed in. From the from non zoomed in, I assumed it was gonna be Bowie for some reason. Well he doesn't he didn't Bowie does have that Ziggy Stardust kind of stuff, but he he didn't quite go as far down the line in these kind of like jumpsuit stuff. So I'm pretty sure this is Presley, right? Yeah, I think it might have been the also the blue lines might have reminded me of Ziggy's face. 
Yeah, you're thinking about Aladdin's son, the other character he did of that era that had the, the lightning bolt down his face. Yes. But it's pretty cool. I, what I do like is I'm a big fan of records and music, as you know. You still have yes. several hundred in your room that belong to me. Um, yes, correct. But I like these homemade ones. I like the one where this dude's taken, he's taken Disco Stew's hands and arms and he's put them over the top of, I guess, Presley. And he's it's called Disco Stew Super Hits. And it's super cool. So this is from uh, Chris Fifth. One again. You, this is all on. Um, this is all on the Instagram. And this one, like I said, I think he's deliberately gone for a little bit of a homemade kind of feel. But his uh, go check out his other stuff on there because it is mind blowing. The both the tattoos and the the merchandise you can buy. They're gonna do it. Nice. All right. <laughs> and the very last one here. I thought, oh, you know, somebody's knocked this up in their spare time. It's a little bit amateurish, but not everyone can be, uh, you know, a top notch professional. But this person. They've had a really good go of making this kind of like plush Muppet-esque toy of Disco Stew until I found out this was an actual <laughs> actual yeah. plush toy line made by applause in 2004 oh my god like it is amateurish i think it's incredible it's very very amateur but there's just something haunting about it i just i want it, it he's got a his face looks like he's been squashed in his afro's all the wrong the wrong shape and size he's but he's got a very muppetish feel about his body and his costume's actually pretty accurate it's a good job but i, I looked at some of the other figures in this line and it's like none of them are good none of them look like the character they're trying to be now is it is it just that you can't get that level of accuracy on a doll that small I don't know but um, I just kept it in there because we've just seen three pieces of Simpsons art which is uh, uh, Stu art the last two particularly that uh, kind of blow it out the water and some of the more that we've seen in the last you know, weeks or so has been amazing. Uh, and yet these people taking actual cash from, from Fox and licensing have, have put out a very substandard stew doll. Is her looks the same as I'm going to, I think she's called Gladys movie. It's, it's the wrong shape completely. It's not an afro. It's more like, again, yeah, it looks like a boobie, like Selma. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's something to do with material because they, they, can't have, they can't have such a bad, they can't have a 100% success rate at poor quality without something being, like, have you seen the itchy and scratchy ones? No. I think they're really bad. Millhouse, I believe I own somewhere, and that's a pretty bad one. If you're going to spend millions of dollars licensing The Simpsons, why not? Why not get your worst people on the job and use substandard materials so that you cannot <laughs> incidentally uh, it seems that applause may have gone out of business within 12 months of these dolls coming out a company that may have been in existence for 50 years before that so it could have been that this stew this stew line actually killed them off possibly and it's strange because you can the 3d thing isn't a problem because all of the games and the figures you know they're very accurate oh figures are great yeah figures are very accurate i see stew right now looking Looking correct. Looking absolutely correct. Now, we're going to have to round this up first, but as promised earlier, we, we, we managed to find just in the bins outside Tesco's, and I was as shocked as you are. It's called Stu's Diary. Stu's Disco Diary, in keeping with the laziest names. Stuart Disco Text Disco Diary is what it's called, in keeping with the laziest yes. names we can possibly think of. And actually, after our conversation about discos earlier in this episode, I went and looked up to see if there are any disco puns and good disco names that all all disco texts have terrible names they're not you know you know you get like curl up and die like is one yeah. her dresser's name that you know i i remember my and favorite is one. hurry shearers say that again my favorite one is there's a hairdresser called hurry shearers oh nice that's a simpsons reference also yeah. yeah, it's just an in, an inside Harry Shearer joke. Really? And is there, that's a real? In The Simpsons. Oh, it's a Simpsons name. Oh, damn yeah, it. I thought there was a, there's one in The Simpsons called Curl Up and Die. That's what oh, I thought you got. I accidentally referenced The Simpsons not knowing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So here's the top here's the top five nightclub names. I mean, come on, we're not in any rush here at this point. The the apparently according to Bar and Restaurant Tempo Texpo dot com. Here are the top 10 names 
of nightclubs in the world and they're all without without exception terrible number one xs nightclub like e- letters x and it. it's a bit of a that's pun. the mo- it's a pun on the word excess though and that in itself doesn't make sense well it does if you're going out there you know you're gonna have an excessively good time the second one's called haksan but that's in Vegas. So, you know, the Marquee, Tau Las Vegas, the Live, the Surrender Nightclub, the Lavo, New York, Story, Miami, the High Bellagio, and the Lavo Las Vegas. Those are not good names, are they? No, they're all very bland, but that's the problem with the real world is that most businesses aren't, you know, naming the business for a, for a brief screenshot gag. Puns, right? They don't use a lot of puns, but some shops use puns though, right? Because it does get the I mean, in, in newspaper articles and stuff. Particularly fish and chip shops or like Chinese takeaways seem to use a lot of puns in the names, like wok's cooking. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? Yes, knickers with attitude. Are you making these up now? Because if you are, you should you should go into business. I, I made that one up. My favourite one, I didn't make this one up, but my friend suggested Balti Towers for an Indian restaurant. That is good. See, you know... Yeah. So it can be done. Well, what about a baker's called Bread Pit? Yeah, exactly. Not Getting these off an the internet. We've got a Thai restaurant called Titanic. That's we've got a, a we've got a, a laundrette called Lord of the Rinse. Can you smell what the wok is cooking? Is that a name of a restaurant? No, I just I, it might be. How about a, how about a uh, kebab shop called Peter Pan? That's good. Took me a second, but I like it. Godfather. The, the, the chip shop next door to us is called a fine kettle of fish, which I quite like. Because it's not really a pun, but I like it still. It's just a, you know, like a phrase. Brian Nemo. That's good. How yeah, about this one? Amy's Wine House. Yeah, that's a good one. Is that acceptable? I think so. Florist Gump. Florist Gump. Fred Zeppelin. Freddie May Curry. <laughs> that's weak. British Herways. Indiana Jeans. <laughs> Jabba the Cut. <laughs> Kung Food. Kung Food. Kung Food. All right, this has gone on far, far. <laughs> can we can we get a couple of pages from Stu's diary before we round up this ridiculously long episode of the Stewcast? Yeah, why not? Um, would you like to pick a page number or yeah, a time? I'd pick page seventeen. Seventeen. That's quite early, but this diary is from his adult life. So. Good. Okay, it just says day 43. Disco Stew is off the sugar. Disco Stew doesn't think that he can carry on this disco lifestyle without sugar, but Disco Stew believes in Disco Stew. Yesterday, Disco Stew went to the Quickie Mart to buy amenities for the week, and it was it was a tough time for the Disco Stew, especially when he saw that Sanjay, who was covering for the day, because that who who's not allowed on in, in Springfield at the minute. Um, he he offered me a squishy for free because I'm such a loyal customer, as was Maud Flanders. But Disco Stew had to say no, and Disco Stew said no confidently, but then was asked a second time, did, did I did Disco Stew want a squishy? So I ended up, Disco Stew ended up running out of the room of the Quickie Mart in floods of tears screaming for Disco Stew's mother. Also, I believe Helen Lovejoy is stealing my plates. Wow. That, I mean, I, I like that we got a little bit of a glimpse into Stew's sugar, sugar, cold turkey. Cold sugar turkey. Probably got the shakes a little bit as he wanders around in his dressing gown around the Quickie Mart, picking up tinned peas and, and the likes, and then uh, gets offered that sweet, sweet, squishy juice. But, um, Turns it down, he stays strong, good on him. You know, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster ride. And it seems like everybody's got an opinion on Helen Lovejoy. So, and I like the fact we got a little bit of a Maud cameo there in Stu's diary. So all in all, it was very good. Yeah, it was a big, a good page to turn to. It certainly was. What's his hand, like, handwriting like? Shaky for that page, I imagine. No, it's surprisingly, um, it's like cursive and very sort of um, declaration of independency. Wow, so very, very flowery. Yeah. I can Calligraphy level. Yeah, he's very. He had almost pre nautical, was called calligraphy stew. Interesting. Those are all interesting, super interesting facts. Now, of course, we have no letters or uh, anything in the inevitable second stew cast. In, uh, in the future, maybe we will have, who knows. But have you got anything to add before we go to the post stutrum song to see us out on this long, long ass episode? No, I don't believe so. I think, I think we've covered what we needed to. It'll be nice. It's been a refreshing and it'll be nice 
nice to dip back into mode. Oh, yes, it certainly will. Who's going first on the song? You. Okay. I see a sea captain. He's sitting in a blue jacket. Normal Stu likes normal things. He needs a wallet size photo for his captain sea pants. Doesn't advertise. He never does. He's a disco stud with the letter D missing. Snow Fox at five o'clock. The glasses go on. A puffy shirt. And the signets of sound of Disco Inferno. And Stu is here. Selma is his Juliet. Stuliet. Who is Stu's 70s rocker friend? And why do we never see him again? John and Olivia Wimby Discotech. <laughs> Huge pants, boots, safari suit. And Disco Fox once again at five o'clock. Unsuccessful plushies. Kneeling down in praise land, go into the wig and casino of my mind. A fine kettle of fish. Racism and homophobia at the height of the disco fever. Did Stu indulge? Stu cast. Stu cast mod. Mod world. Stu 2020. Sad bag eyes. Sad plushy. Sad plushy face. Happy plushy face. Grimy. Grimy. Grimes cast. Raheem. Disco cast. Sideshow Stu. Oh, sideshow side show Stu. The end. Sideshow Stu. Mod's sister. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Well, we did it, Nathan. We, Fine. we did it. There may be only us two that made it this far. You did. Here is a medallion to hang around your neck. We did it. Stewcast episode one, aka Modcast episode ten. Of the figures who were that party. The end. <laughs>